Thank you, Alan. And uh, thanks very much for asking me to come and speak to you today. It's uh, really nice to, to be here in person again. Uh, as you know, when the NIF attends a conference, it's not always without incident. I remember on one occasion, one of our staff, I don't know who it was, the president of the fire alarm and fire brigade turned up. But there were no incidents last night anyway, so all good. Um, I'm going to tell you today um, a little bit about the management of the NIF and uh, a particular aspect of my work. And um, yeah, I think this can be transported to other areas of Scotland and to other management, management areas. So, uh, southwest Scotland, as far south as we, as we can get, and on the sunny south coast, and uh, a long, slim catchment. And this is the stark reality. This is the background to what I'm going to talk to you about. 2008, 4,500 salmon declared catch, and I think that's very conservative. It's had a dreadful reputation of not reporting very well um, salmon catches. 2022, 414. So, um, a disastrous drop. And what that has meant is it's been very challenging financially to try and maintain a management unit faced with uh, owners trying to uh, pay their assessments, etc., to the board. And it's been very challenging financially. Environmentally, um, it's been challenging as well because we can't afford to lose any any more fish out of there. So um, I have a very in, industrialized catchment. Um, some of you will know that it was a former coal mining area. But now anybody that drives down the North catchment will see so many wind farms there. And a lot of my job is to uh, be involved in the consultation process for those uh, those developments. I attend sites and uh, I meet with the developers and that's one of my colleagues here today. I've, uh, I've been in meetings with, with, with Andrea and I meet with the construction people involved with, with wind farms and other industrial processes. Um, it's my duty to tell these people, look, there's salmon in the river close by where you're going to develop. So you're going to have to take um, precautions when you're going to build there. Uh, we agree um, to establish accurate environmental data. It's no good having a look at electrofishing data that's 10 years old. So we want current, up-to-date data. I then respond in planning. Uh, it's, uh, we don't live in, 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 in isolation. We need roads, we need railways and all the rest of it. So, so um, no is not an option, it's yes, but. And uh, so I spend a long time in planning consultation. Uh, I input to uh, construction method statements. I'm allowed that, that, that luxury where the construction industry will come to me and say, well, you're the guy that knows about fish. You come and tell us and we'll input that into our construction method statements. And we agree a schedule of works. So construction project requirements, health and safety. They need to know, you don't just rock up at a construction site and say, well, I'll do a bit of electrification for you. It just doesn't work like that. The, the process starts in the office. They need to know that we are a professional outfit, that we're actually, we've got policies in place to protect our staff so it's safe for us to go on to, to the site. They want to know all about our policies how, 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 how professional are we? No, we've got uh, environmental policies, anti-bullying now, you can read them yourself. And I see, Andrea, you were making sure you didn't fall foul of the anti-bribery policy last night. You yeah. didn't get me a drink. <laughs> I, 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 I don't think it's a big thing about it, I'll just, I'll just bring that up. Um, <clears throat> and of course they want to know about our staff qualifications. Are we competent to do the job and as well as the the, the qualifications which you will know about um, electrification certification etc we need to have uh, construction skill, uh, skills certificates to be able to go on to a construction site it's a dangerous place 
Job specific risk assessment. So we've risk assessed it from our point of view. And then we go on to site and we get an induction so that we're safe to go on that site. All our equipment needs to be pat tested, of course. You'll all do that. Because we're on commercial work, we carry two sets of equipment. It's very expensive. We can't afford a breakdown. Whilst on site, we are doing a range of surveys that are around about the aquatic environment. It's not just about fish. So we'll offer a suite of environmental work that we can do. We, again, we feed that information. If, for example, we were to find freshwater pearl mussels, it would be you know, a holding on to us to bring that to the attention. And we would alter the construction method statement, or we would ask the, the, the developer to alter the construction method statement to take account of that. I will then even do two box talks on site to make sure that the staff, the construction staff on the site was a very good at diggers and digging up dirt, maybe don't know very much about fish. As I'm doing things like fish rescues, quite often the site will stop work and the staff will get out of the diggers and they'll come and watch what's actually happening. And that's a light bulb moment because they're, they, they're saying, right, I thought you were havering, I thought you were just going through the motions there. When you start to show them juvenile salmon and you're teaching people the difference between salmon and trout, it's a light bulb moment. Come on, they understand what they're doing. And then we report the results at an appropriate level. This is not a thesis. This is not a university lecture we're delivering here. We report it in terms that the construction industry can understand. And uh, that's quite important. We've also got client commercial confidentiality. The board has the information. Client has the, has the, the information. No third parties get that unless it's to be used for the likes of SEPA to protect our river system. I'm going to give you some examples. I'm going to uh, rattle through these pretty quick because you can see them for yourself. This is a Scottish water sewer replacement at Kirkconnell. You can see they had to enter the water environment. This is the sort of thing that I would get involved with. And uh, they all follow a typical pattern. So you would do some baseline statistics, establish the current state of the aquatic environment, make sure that that's like that when the job is finished. Very big job. This is actually on the fringes of Pedro's estate. Um, network rail, the river line fell into the river one night and it could have been a big rail disaster. Big landslip there. And uh, we were involved for a number of years looking at the aquatic environment round about that incident. Right in the middle of New Cumnock, Ayrshire Roads Alliance, done a um, flood prevention scheme, very badly impacted by the flood a number of years ago, and this is the new scheme. There was no alternative. They had to get inside the water environment to be able to do the job. We allowed that under strict controls and mitigation was put in place to enable that to happen. Very successful job. We still got fish in the river afterwards. That's our goal. So this is a spend job. Um, Spen are coming to increase the size of the Glen Glass substation. You'll see the river in the background there, Rukin Water, Salmon Spawning River, and uh, one which we're very keen to protect. So I'm engaged with Spen at the moment, and we're looking at various different aquatic surveys that we can do for these people to ensure that this site is protected as, as a fish habitat. What do we achieve when we do this? Well, from Andrea's point of view, she can clearly see that she's complied with environmental law with regard to the aquatic environment. Her green credentials have been fulfilled, so her employers are, 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 are happy. We, as a district salmon fishery board, we fulfilled our duty of care to migratory salmon and species of fish. Most importantly, the aquatic environment has been protected and we have a means to measure that protection. It's not just a question of I say it's good. We've got a means to protect it and measure that. 
We've provided a professional service, and these people regularly ask us to come and work for them again because it is a professional service. If they're running a site that's worth millions of pounds, it's no good rocking up at half past 11 with a, a bag of crisps there and you're going to have your lunch. No, you're there early in the morning, you get the job done. And uh, so any, any finance that comes from that gets recirculated back into the, the river management on the NIF. I'm going to hand over to Andrea now, and she's going to tell you from the developer's point of view. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. So, I suppose from my point of view, um, it's probably quite user all kind of built on a way because we're getting to the end of the day, right? So I'll try and keep it as concise as possible. Um, but it's been good for me to be here as a, essentially a construction entity to see the, the, the Scottish Government strategy <coughs> like cascading right down through your organisations into the actual boots on the ground. Um, and how we then get the, the various improvements and things like that done around um, the fisheries and stuff like that. So this has been quite good for me. Um, myself, I've been in the construction industry for, for circa 16, 17 years. And for me, there's been a common theme throughout today. So this is not just a step change. This is a massive full throttle change in the way that we do environmental management. And I think being in Scottish Power and Energy Networks for the duration of that time, myself and my colleague, the sustainability manager, Jill is here as well, we've seen a significant change in the way that we do business. Environmental isn't just something that is an add-on. Environmental is very much embedded into our business as usual and something that we um, take on board as, as the way health and safety is now. So for that, I, I see that as a good thing. Um, so in terms of who we are, right, in terms of who SPT projects are, we're not wind farms and we're not hydro, right? So just, I need to clarify that before anybody starts talking about hydro scenes. So who we are, we, the Scottish Power Energy Networks business um, operates uh, and maintains a network within Scotland from around Stirling area right down to the border. So any network infrastructure, whether that's overhead lines, underground cable or substations is, is being built by SP Energy Networks. Um, within SP Energy Networks, there are um, two areas. There's the SP transmission, area and the SP distribution area. Myself and Jill work in the SP transmission, which is 132 kV and above. And the reason I'm highlighting that is because the distribution who work in the, the, the kind of lower levels will be in and out and liaison on a different level with the, the fisheries trust as well. Um, as you come down again for SP SPT transmission, you have operations and projects. So operations are the guys who are out maintaining the existing network and making sure there isn't any faults, making sure there's not any power cuts. And our area of the business is the area that is doing any refurbishments in any construction of any existing network. So we are a regulated business. We don't have any interface um, with the likes of Scottish Power Renewables. They're a completely separate entity. Um, Scottish Power um, Retail and all that, that's all a completely separate business. Uh, so why am I here today? I'm here today to just explain how we fit into that scenario of mm. the fisheries. I want to build relationships with the various trusts or et cetera that we'll be working with. Um, I, want to, I want to understand the requirements that, that we can fulfil and make business as usual um, for us to, to do and then basically explore opportunities to collaborate due, through our biodiversity funds that are available and things like that as an organisation. Um, what I picked up from today is that there's a, lot of, there's a lot of things that have been mentioned and it's worth highlighting that we are boots on the ground. We are very much boots on the ground who can deliver things on the ground um, through whatever um, mechanism we, we engage with. Um, and we are also funding, essentially, to do certain certain activities. Um, and it, the, the, I can't remember the gentleman's name that stood in for Brendan and, and, and talked about doing the right thing with public money. And that's very much what we have to justify as part of our licence agreements. Um, we're not a bottomless pit of money, but we very much, if we can justify with the various regulators the improvements that we are doing for the wider environment, for the catchments, then that's something that we, we can very much fund and support. Um, but in reality, we are a construction company. We can very much have a positive or negative impact on the environment during our works. That's just the nature of construction. So that's why we want your input to, to make sure we minimise that. So there's a couple of things I'm going to touch on. Um, and it's how we operate as a business so that people can understand um, the, the challenges that we face as an organisation. The pipeline of work that we've got, which is massive. Um, the communication channels that we've got and basically our commitments. So... The legislative background around 
SVT transmission is that we have a transmission licence and under that there's a number, number of obligations that we have to fulfil. I've highlighted four key ones here um, and uh, the, the first one is compliance. So that, that is a must, that is a given. We have to comply with legislation, we have to comply with law. Um, our works are planned and we have to do that. Um, the second thing is our price control. So under our current price review period, which is 2021 to 2025, we have a price control that is our baseline projects. We have a business plan for that, which is publicly available. There's a screenshot over there, um, the T2 business plan. So we are in the T2 price review period and we have a baseline plan of what we are going to deliver to drive to net zero, right? Um, the thing that adds on to that is connections. We are the only company from Stirling to the borders who can provide a connection to wind farms, hydrogen, battery, EV vehicles. So all these things that everybody's doing to drive net zero, the only company that can facilitate that and is under obligation to facilitate that is Scottish Power and Energy Networks. So in terms of scheme, in terms of workloads, over the last 10 years we have quadrupled in terms of everyone is driving towards net zero and the, the, the company that can facilitate that is Energy Networks. So how we then re um, regulate that is we have a reporting process, we report to Ofgem on an annual basis against our targets that have been committed in the, the business plan and also against any third party connections that we do. So we're very much um, controlled in that manner. Uh, so in terms of transmission as an enabler for net zero, uh, with that there comes the, the future energy scenarios in, in terms of the, the Scotland as a whole and there is a drive to get 60 gigawatts of wind power across Scotland um, by 2040 and also an increase in the transfer requirements between Scotland and England to 40 gigawatts and the scary fact about that is we're sitting at 6.6 .6 gigawatts at the moment and we did that in 10 years in the last price review period. So we went from delivering the 6.6, .6, which wasn't actually that because we had two point something before. We delivered about 3.3 .3 in the last price review period and we're trying to get it to, to 40 over the next period. So it's a massive, massive infrastructure change. Um, the biggest that Scotland's probably ever seen um, and probably will see. So with that comes massive amount of construction, massive overhead lines that, 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 that scar the landscape essentially as we're doing the construction. So. We need to think about that and how we how we work with the various um, bodies and that. So, in terms of projects, um, we have routes of communication with our projects that, for me, um, and I don't know if there's anything involved in planning here, right? But it doesn't the, the planning process for us doesn't match the environmental impact. So, when we look at planning for for an overhead line scheme, it falls underneath Section Thirty Seven of the Environmental Act, and that looks very much focused on visual impact, but for fisheries, visual impact is, is nothing. We are talking about the actual impact of the construction on the ground and the pollution prevent, the pollution potential and the runoff and the, the water quality and things like that. So we go through schemes where we have the new overhead line schemes that go out to public consultation, they go through a full EIA um, and they will go through the planning process and they may land on somebody's desk, they may land on the, the fisheries board's desk and that's assessed and there's feedback um, it goes through that. New substations, they sometimes, depending on the size, will go through the local, local authority plan commission and the same thing may happen, you may receive information around them. The scary fact is refurbishments fall under permitted developments. So a refurbishment of an existing overhead line scheme would fall under um, the planning process, right? But from an environmental point of view, an environmental impact, you still need an access road, stone access road that creates runoff. You still need to do temporary culverts across water crossings. You still have to have um, all your construction sites set up. So in terms of the environmental impact potential to the water environment, it's the same, but it falls under that planning. So this is where um, we're working with Jim um, and other fisheries trusts as well to say, look, you might not have seen this scheme, but it's coming your way. We're up in the voltage to drive to net zero from 275 to 400, um, et cetera, et cetera. Can we have some kind of liaison and engagement on that to make sure that we don't um, cause any problems with that? And for me, um, the main thing I want to get out here is regardless of whether the project was through planning, we still have the same approach as an organisation. SPT still have the same approach to how we work with the fisheries trusts um, or any regulator, to be fair. Um, cable projects, again, um, they, 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 they fall under permitted developments and the way we engage is very much dependent on the ecology survey that we would, we would request as part of the project development and it would potentially highlight um, ecological issues that we might have to consider. Um, so that's just highlighting the differences and how that um, doesn't really necessarily align with the impact. Um, with that said, we have opportunities here to think about how we engage going forward. We've got a massive amount of work. 
There's a number of people in the room who will work in our potential network area, um, happy to engage, happy to talk about potential projects that we can work on, happy to talk about how we, we, we mitigate issues. Um, around that, it's when do we approach the fisheries? Who do we contact in the various businesses? Um, what surveys need to be carried out? What time? I mean, where we've got our pipeline of projects for the next 10 years. Do we engage now on the ones that are happening in three years? What, what, what do we want to do? And I'm open to suggestion on that. Um, do you also want to know as a regulatory body about incidents, pollution incidents in rivers? Is that something that you would be interested in? We report to CEPA, but is it something the fisheries might want to know? Um, and what training is required? Do we need to engage with yourself to educate our workforce? We have grown in headcount in the last year. I think we've recruited, in 2022, sorry, we recruited 110 people. Um, this year, we're, we're, I think we've got in 74 headcount increase this year alone. So with that comes people from different industries, different nationalities, different environments. Um, and we want to make sure we have that consistent approach. So what training do you think we need to do? Do we need to tell you more about what we're doing, etc.? Um, and we also want to collaborate. There's a, a massive opportunity here for us to collaborate on enhancements. So what, what we are doing has been talk about this biodiversity tool, the National Planning Framework 4 and things like that. And that is something that we are, we've been involved in those consultations. We will be using on our projects. Um, but again, we don't want generic enhancement suggestions. We want to speak to the person who knows that the bend of that river could do we have in this planting regime or the bend in that river could have this. We want specifics so that we can then take that and make it bespoke and actually work for the catchments that we're doing the improvements in. Um, and that's where your, 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 and your kind of advice and support is invaluable for us as an organisation. Um, so next slide. This is, um, so I've talked about our business plan. So in terms of our business plan and um, our regulatory, regulatory, so I can say that word, with our position with Ofgem, there has been a massive step change for us. So it's interesting to see how that step changes has come down through the government to um, the various organisations to us and we now have these massive requirements on us from a sustainability point of view. Um, the three that really interest me is the pollution prevention, the pl preventing pollution, sorry, um, looking at our works and the massive potential pollution, pre pollution impact we can have due to those works and the linear projects and the, the imported stone access roads and the runoff from that and things like that is massive. And I really want to know how we can minimise that as we go forward. Enhancing biodiversity. We have a, a target of having net zero on our projects are positive. But if anybody's ever worked on a substation or been in a substation, it's not somewhere where we actually want anything to live because it's a substation we want to be closed off to any kind of ecological um, species. So we have to think about offsetting. We have to think about the locality or where the substation is. Can we look at the catchment? Can we look at the rivers adjacent to that, etc.? Um, and that, that's um, what we are doing. Uh, sustainable resource use, again, that's something where we, we have targets of diverting 95% of our waste from landfill and stuff like that. So there's a lot around materials as well. Um, what this means for us, uh, the challenges with this, um, which I picked up from today going through a number of the presentations, is that we're not a landowner, right? So uh, from a, a, a position where we can do improvements, we don't own any land, we have way leaves to do the works that we do. Um, so therefore, we can't just suggest things. We, we need the landowners to buy into it. We need the regulators to buy into it before we can actually do the things. Um, what else? The car regulations is something else that's mentioned today. So uh, the car regulations, as we're doing our temporary roads and we're doing all our temporary crossings, um, it's something that I never actually thought about when we engage when we do our temporary crossings that came up today um, with the abstractions. But it's very much something we should be looking at because we would position the road wherever was the, the straightest road straightest road going to the, 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 um, the tower base, whereas there might be a particular species that might affect the salmon, it might be something else. So it's maybe something we need to take away from this to think if we're putting in our crossings and looking at where our average overhead line, we're talking about 110, 120 crossings um, per, per, per overhead line route. So um, think about that. Um, so I've met, I did write peatlands down, right? So there's a lot of work we can do around peatlands as well. We need to think about that. Uh, so in terms of final thoughts, right? So as SPT, we know what our plan is. We are already working on the T3 plan, which is 2026 and beyond for seven years. We know where our projects are. We know what we're doing. Um, and it's within our gift um, now to define a process. Quality environment sits underneath. We're responsible for processes as well as environmental. So 
if we need to have a business as usual process for how we engage, what we do, how that's done, when that's done, it's very much within mine and Jill can take that away and build that into the project delivery. Um, and we cannot effectively deliver against our commitments without engaging with the stakeholders. There's no way that we are going to meet the 2025 deadline if we do not get use giving us advice and use telling us how to do it because we don't have the skills in house. So it's very much not begging for you to help, but I really would appreciate the help. Um, and the final point for myself is collaborating on training. Um, and that's both ways, as I kind of touched on. We, we've got a massive workforce, we've got a massive supply chain in terms of how many people we've got working for us in terms of the contractors. Is there something we can do as an industry-wide thing from a construction point of view? Should we be telling you about how the construction is done so that you can then see where the, the potential impacts could be, etc., etc. And again, I'm open to how we do that and how we work together. But the bottom line is we've got a lot to do. We've got to do it really quickly and we can all help each other get there is, is the, the final thought on it. Um, and that's me. <laughs>